Hi, everyone, and welcome to Collar Capital's Private Capital Secondary Market Webinar. I'm Paige Brotherton, a partner and head of investor relations and fundraising for the Americas at Collar. We're hosting this webinar at our New York office, and I'm pleased to be joined today by three of my colleagues to discuss the latest key trends in the private capital secondary market. We have Paul Lana, a partner on our investment team and voting member of our flagship secondary fund. Daisy Huang, a principal on our investment team and a member of our limited partnership opportunity team who focuses on diversified LP-led transactions. And John Liu, a principal on our credit secondaries team. We're going to discuss the current state of the private capital secondary market and highlight recent developments and major drivers, as well as provide an outlook for the rest of the year. Today, we'll be covering global trends in secondaries, recent developments in LP-LEDs and GP-LEDs, and the current state and outlook for the private credit secondaries market. If you have any questions, please submit them via the Ask the Question button that you see on the screen, and we'll get back to you after the webinar. Paul, Daisy, John, really happy to have you here with me today. Let's dive in. So earlier this year, macro headwinds, including high inflation, rising volatility, and bank failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse caused market uncertainty that led to a slowdown in PE-backed M&A and IPO exits. Daisy, why don't we start with you? What did this mean for LPs in the secondary market? So for LPs, it means lower distributions from decreased M&A activity and IPO exits. This has really created a liquidity crunch for many LPs, and many have used the secondary market to generate some of this liquidity. For the secondary buyers, um, it means that the uncertain macro environment tends to favor more conservatism, and as a result, more diversification. And so for the first half of the year, we really saw an increase in the LP-led activity, which accounted for 60% of the total secondaries volume, which historically has been closer to 40 and 50%. Um, over the course of 2023, the market has definitely improved um, and has led to more positive buyer sentiment, and as a result, um, more activity from both buyers and sellers. Interesting. Um, Paul, what have you seen in terms of the impact on pricing and then overall transaction volume? Last year, um, if you went back to look at 2022, you had a lot of uncertainty. Um, you had a market that was volatile and in some cases, you know, for most of the year, probably declining. Um, so with, with that in mind, we were seeing pricing probably in the 80s, I would say, call it a 20% discount. As you come into 23, and the, I think the economic outlook has improved. The market has improved. We've seen that price narrow, pricing uh, discount narrow to more like 10%, so call it 90 cent pricing. Um, at 90 cents, you have a lot more sellers, right? So we're seeing volumes pick up materially. So we talked about factors that are impacting the sell side. Um, John, can you tell us a little bit about the buy side landscape in secondaries these days? Sure. In a nutshell, uh, the market is undercapitalized. Um, as Paul and Daisy mentioned, uh, it remains largely a buyer's market. If we look at the numbers from the start of 23 to now, um, there's roughly 130 billion of investable dry powder that we estimate in the private equities in the secondaries market. Uh, and that is against uh, about 105 billion of, of actual reported transaction volume over the course of last year. That translates into a, roughly a 1.2 times coverage. Um, now, to put that a little bit in context, you contrast that with uh, traditional private equity, uh, where that coverage is almost double um, you know, on the capital side relative to the number of transactions that were done uh, in, in traditional PE. So that, that helps to really kind of clearly lay out um, the undercapitalization in the space. This is even more evident in the nascent private credit secondaries market, where you have roughly six and a half billion of investable dry powder uh, against roughly 18 billion of, of transaction volume over the course of the past year. Um, now, we expect transaction volume to pick up over the course of 23, but if you even think that we run rate somewhere along the lines of where we, where we were in 22, um, then you're really looking at less than five months of, of investable dry powder um, if you were to look at that ratio today. Now, going forward, we expect that this balance will start to shift and, and improve. A very strong secondaries fundraising environment um, 
is, is going to help that. And so you know, you're going to see less undercapitalization tomorrow than you will yesterday. Uh, and if you see that in the backdrop of uh, an improving market economy, as Paul mentioned, um, and if you think that we're trending towards a soft landing, then certainly buyer sentiment um, can shift and, and will we'll continue to improve. Thanks, John. Um, I do want to transition a little bit now to focus on LP-led secondary transactions, which increased proportionally in the first half of 2023. So Daisy, earlier this year, we know that many LPs who wanted to sell in the secondary market were not able to. And when you think about the deals that did get done, though, what was it about them that made them uniquely successful? Mm -hmm. Buyers have definitely been more selective um, in terms of the types of portfolios that did ultimately get sold. Uh, we're talking about higher quality uh, buyout managers as opposed to venture or growth types of uh, fund interests. Also, there was a skew towards younger vintage portfolios. Um, I think we saw on average uh, from a Jeffries report that right now the average age of an LP portfolio is roughly seven years, which is the lowest it's been since 2012. Um, other elements of uh, deals that got done you had a lot of buyers lean into uh, high quality GPs and more blue chip names where they have a high degree of conviction on the performance of the portfolio going forward and the underwritten returns. And then also finally, the use of deferrals and delayed closing to really bridge the gap on pricing. So portfolios are getting younger. And one of the other trends we've seen are larger and larger deals coming to the market. I uh, wonder if you could talk about what's driving um, the trends behind the increase in size and also how these transactions are actually playing out. Uh, we've definitely seen larger transactions come to market. Uh, year to date, there's been several multi-billion dollar portfolios from uh, pension funds. Uh, and these transactions have really generated liquidity for the sellers in the one to four and a half billion dollar range um, from portfolio bids from buyers in that one plus billion dollar range. So definitely larger transactions uh, garnering much more interest from buyers who are able to put forth solutions that are in that one plus billion dollar range. What's driving this trend is really 2023 has seen an improvement in the uh, sentiment from more reduced uncertainty around private equity valuations, robust earnings reports from companies, all of these factors have generally led to more positive buyer sentiment. And as a result, some of the sellers who were on the sidelines have now come forward, given that they have seen um, generally an improvement in the amount of activity. So that all sounds really positive. Uh, could you share with us the outlook for the rest of 2023 and into 2024? Mm -hmm. We expect LP volume in 2023 to be $60 billion. Um, obviously, that assumes the bid-ask spread between buyer and seller pricing to continue to narrow. In the first half of the year, LP led volume, as I had said earlier, was around 60%. And we expect that trend to persist throughout the, year, uh, the second half of the year. You know, obviously, we still think that there is a very uh, positive LP pricing environment right now relative to history and relative to 2021. There is still a degree of macro uncertainty in the market, and there is still a lot of seller overhang in terms of PE allocation. So we expect this positive pricing environment to persist. Thanks, Daisy. Really insightful. Really appreciate it. Um, I do want to transition to the other part, the other major part anyway, of the secondary market, which are GP leads. Um, we saw GP-led deal activity drop comparatively in the first half of 2023. What happened? Um, look, I, don't, I don't think there's been any uh, diminished desire on behalf of the GPs to want to do GP-leds. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, the, the reasons a GP would want to uh, bring a GP-led to market have only increased, right? There, there's still a lack of liquidity and, and LPs are still clamoring for liquidity. I think. I think What's happened is first, GP leads take a long time, call it three to six months to complete. So when you look at the first half of 2023, you're really looking at what was in market in the second half of 2022 or what was going on in the market in the second half of 2022. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, there was a lot of volatility in that market. Markets were moving quite a bit. Uh, there was uncertainty around uh, the macro environment. So uh, it was difficult 
for GP LEDs to get completed in that market. Mm -hmm. uh, pricing on a GP LED typically has to be pretty close to the uh, FMV that the GP reports. Uh, it's challenging to do that when you have a volatile market. But, but the other factor is that LP portfolios were pricing at, which at, at you know, historically attractive returns, call it 80 cents or 20% discounts. When you can, when a buyer has the opportunity to do a GP led or an LP led, and the returns are similar, I think in most cases the buyers are going to lean towards LP leds. They're more diversified. They're easier to complete. They make a lot of sense in that market. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, so we've seen a lot of evolution in GP leds. I'm wondering if you can just talk about some current trends that we're seeing. I think I think the the emphasis on quality. Um, of both the GP and the assets is is uh, is very important right now, right? So I think I think if any GP led we see coming to market, and I'm talking about continuation funds, right? Which is typically where a GP takes assets from one fund and sells them into a new ass a new fund that they're going to manage. Um, the, the we're only seeing the highest quality assets and and best quality GPs come to market with those sorts of transactions today. Um, the other trends that we're seeing, I think there is uh, a real emphasis on alignment. The buyer universe wants to be involved in transactions where the GP is very clearly wanting to put more capital behind an asset rather than take capital away. So strong alignment with, with the general partners is critical. And I think, I think the last thing I would I'd mention is there is a real emphasis on, uh, in, in, in most transactions, adding some unfunded capital to go out and pursue M&A or to uh, delever the balance sheet. That, that, I think, is a reflection of what is a pretty difficult financing market. So GP LEDs are, are an interesting way for GPs to pull more, more capital into the companies that they want to support. So Daisy gave us an expectation that LP LEDs will be about a $60 billion market for 2023. Um, do you have a forecast for GP LEDs for the rest of the year? Look, I think I think it's it's always hard to forecast the number, but it will be uh, it'll be an increase from the first half of the year, and collectively we think the market will will be somewhere around a hundred billion. So mm -hmm. call that forty or fifty billion dollars for GP Leds uh, this year. So Paul, GP Leds has been one of the more exciting places of the secondary market for the past many years, but let's switch now to private credit secondaries, which has been in the spotlight recently, given how quickly the market has grown. So John, a question that we often get is that given that credit instruments have a shorter lifespan, they've got contractual payments and they mature, you know, why does a secondary market need to exist for private credit? Um, what would you say to that question? Yeah, it's a great question. It's one that we get um, quite often. Uh, and you're absolutely correct that you know, credit assets typically have a shorter lifespan than private equity assets, um, say two to five years on average. Uh, but what we have to remember here is that uh, these assets generally sit in funds. Um, and these funds have um, an investable life and the ability to recycle typically for three to five years after a close. Um, so when you marry that together, really you're looking at um, you know, an ultimate term that's closer to seven or eight years, um, which is much longer than um, you know, the life of the individual assets themselves. And as for you know, sellers of, of private credit assets, uh, why they pursue the market um, the variety of reasons very much mirrors uh, why people pursue exits for private equity um, portfolios. Um, this could be portfolio rebalancing, changes to regulatory uh, requirements. Um, it could be a, a shift in investment mandate, investment strategy, or views on GPs. Um, whatever that rationale may be, what we do know is that the reality of when that liquidity need um, you know, is, is rampant, um, it doesn't always align with uh, when uh, the distribution profile and uh, determinants of, of these funds will, will actually be. And so for that reason, there needs to be a private, you know, we think there needs to be a private credit uh, secondaries market to exist. While we're seeing that, um, you know, real time, uh, what you can see in, in this current market, um, you know, today, is that with the backdrop of uh, what Paul and Daisy have been speaking about, um, with slower M&A activity, with a capital markets environment that is more challenged, being more expensive and less accessible today than maybe two years ago, um, and, and really, um, you know, a number of factors that uh, constrain the DPI in private equity portfolios, um, you're seeing this also reflected in, in the private credit space. Um, prepayments have slowed down, uh, realizations, you know, through the traditional outlets of, of how loans ultimately get taken out, whether it's through, you know, M&A, 
uh, whether it's through a change of control or the organic growth, uh, fundamental growth of a business, um, all of that is going to be a little bit tougher today um, than, than maybe a couple years ago. And we're seeing that, um, you know, really kind of challenge uh, some of these private credit funds that aren't seeing uh, refinancing and distribution paces at the levels they were before. And this only exacerbates the need for alternative liquidity solutions in private credit secondaries, as opposed to allowing these funds to organically wind down. So I think you make a very compelling argument of why the market should exist. Um, it's also grown very, very quickly. Can you just talk about some of the drivers behind that growth? We think there are a couple of uh, key drivers of, of the growth. Um, the first one just being uh, the private credit market growth as a whole. Um, now remember, this is an asset class that uh, really was born and, and had accelerated growth coming out of GFC. Uh, so in itself, private credit is, is not that mature of an asset class. Um, it's just experienced very, very rapid growth. Um, frequent estimates that there's roughly one and a half trillion of, of private credit assets that sit in you know, traditional fund structures. Uh, and for us, we estimate that that number is even greater when you factor in um, assets that don't sit in traditional funds, but sit in vehicles such as BDCs or CLOs or SMAs. Um, so things not measured specifically by frequent. And we estimate that market as a whole to be maybe closer to three trillion. Um, and, and the consensus is, is that this um, this asset class is not slowing in growth anytime soon. For us, uh, in, in secondaries, we like to say that um, primary capital raise is always a leading indicator of potential secondary volume. Um, with the size of the private credit market, we thought it was only a matter of time before an addressable market was established, and that's what we're seeing today. Um, as to the second point as to why it's been such rapid growth, um, really, if you look at the private credit secondary type of transaction, uh, this transaction in and of itself is not super innovative or new. Um, private equity secondaries has been a, a tool and a use of, of liquidity for CIOs and allocators for many years um, who have tapped the market in order to kind of address their, their portfolio rebalancing and, and liquidity needs. What was able to be done in order to unlock um, private credit secondaries was really having the appropriate cost of capital to address uh, you know, this asset class, which fundamentally carries a very different risk return profile than traditional PE. And in the world of Field of Dreams, you know, if you build it, uh, they will come. Um, what we're seeing today is a, a market that's approaching uh, almost $18 billion in volume, which a decade ago was only a half a billion dollars. Uh, on a go-forward basis, uh, we think that there's momentum and, and growth to for this market size to approach 50 billion. And really at that number, it's, it's, we're really talking about only one to 2% um, of the addressable capital in private credit transacting a year, which we think is very achievable and makes us very excited for the go forward um, uh, prospects of the space. So Caller has actually been investing in private credit secondaries for more than a decade, um, but just out of our flagship fund. And as you know, it's just two years ago that we, that we raised and enclosed a dedicated private credit secondary fund. Um, can you just talk about how having this dedicated pool of capital with the appropriate cost of capital actually fits into our interactions with the various sellers globally? I think in general, this has been very positive in our discussions with our sellers and our relationships. Daisy alluded to earlier the, um, the growing number of, of kind of pensions and institutions that have been tapping the LP market uh, in order to sell larger and larger portfolios. Now, these portfolios um, are not only large, but they're diversified across both vintage um, as well as GPs, um, but also across strategies and asset classes. Uh, and for those latter two um, you know, factors, uh, having a private credit pool of capital um, enables us to unlock a lot of liquidity solutions and a, and, and a lot of transactions. For us, when we present to, to a seller that we have both the cost of capital and dedicated team to, to underwrite across an entire risk spectrum of alternatives from private equity to private credit, um, it really makes us the, the preferred partner um, since we can provide the most holistic and complete solution uh, for a lot of these sellers. Um, just recently, there, there was a transaction that we completed earlier this year um, whereby a close pension relationship of ours selected Collar on the basis of the fact that we were able um, to, to address the most holistic solution for them across both private equity and private credit. This demonstrated that us having um, these distinct pools of capital in order to kind of underwrite for uh, a best solution for a seller uh, really makes us uniquely differentiated in the space. Thanks, John. Um, private credit secondaries is definitely one of the most exciting parts of the market. So we look forward to seeing how you and the team um, continue to do. 
So despite lower deal volume earlier this year and improved macro trends mean that there's optimism uh, for a strong second half of 2023. Paul, uh, what trends do you expect to see for the rest of the year and heading into 2024? Um, well, I think we expect deal volume to, to go up for the rest of the year and, and, and hopefully into 2024. Um, as, as we talked about earlier, the, the LP, the desire for LPs to get liquidity hasn't changed at all, right? The M&A market is slow. The IPO market is slow. The dividend recap market is slow. Um, so if, if you, you want to continue to invest in your private equity program or private, private credit program for that matter, um, you're going to have to get liquidity somewhere. The secondary market is where you get that liquidity. Uh, GPs are also looking at the secondary market and saying, how do I get my DPI up? How do I deliver capital back to LPs so that they can then hopefully reinvest it into my own funds? So with pricing in an, in an area where both buyers and sellers uh, can transact, I would expect the volumes go up uh, for the rest of the year and, and, and I would expect that to continue in 2024. And Daisy, what growth projections are you seeing um, for secondaries for the rest of the year? Uh, for 2023, I think as Paul had mentioned earlier, we're expecting over 100 billion of volume in the secondaries market. Uh, by 2030, we're expecting 500 billion of, of volume in the secondaries market. A big source of that uh, capital we expect to come from private wealth investors uh, towards secondaries funds. And John, uh, with recent macro headwinds, there's been a big focus on strategies that are durable in any part of the economic cycle. So do you consider secondaries to be an all-weather strategy? I think we like to say that secondaries is an asset class that is uh, good in good times and great in tough times. You know, the reason for this is, you know, you're ultimately taking less risk. Um, you're in more diversified, uh, you know, portfolios. Uh, and you have lower dispersion of outcomes, which helps to create both both a great absolute return as well as a great risk adjusted return. And we think that you know, going forward that will continue to exist in this asset class, um, not least of which for the reason of, of the undercapitalization that, that uh, we continue to discuss. Um, you know, for us, uh, in good times, we're able to buy with conviction um, into great assets and great portfolios. In tough times and periods of dislocation, um, you know, we find that we can be very opportunistic with our capital um, to find some of the best returning assets and investments, um, you know, that, that contribute to our fund. Um, all of this mix means that um, it, as a whole, the, the strategy should, should be an outperformer um, and we think has a home in any allocator's portfolio. So this is a very exciting time in the evolution and specialization and growth for the secondaries market. So a big thank you to Paul, Daisy, and John for joining me today and sharing your views. If you submitted a question, we will get back to you soon. And also, if you have any feedback on this webinar, we have a survey directly on this platform that you can complete. From all of us at Collar Capital, thank you for tuning in.